Welcome back to another episode of the Dicenius Review. I'm Alexandra Constantine, and the Dicenius Review is a podcast where I like to discuss everything from art, culture, or just have a conversations with guests. Today's going to be a little bit different. Um, it's early afternoon here in South Carolina, and this is the first recording since I've gotten back from my trip to North Carolina. I decided to take a few days off from work, from really from life in general, and spend some time in the mountains, the uh, Smoky Mountains, west of Asheville, where I took my daughter, my wife, our two dogs, and uh, got ourselves a little Airbnb cabin and spent a few days just frolicking around a beautiful stream, going on some trails, and just enjoying the outdoors. The best thing about it was that the cabin we stayed had you could have you had no reception on our cell phones and while there was a wi-fi connection that was included i did not hook up my phone i did not bring my laptop i did nothing of the sort we didn't turn the tv on we didn't watch anything we just spent time we told stories um my wife read us out of a horror novel she's reading around the campfire. We watched the dogs frolic in the, in the stream, and it was just a fantastic time away from everybody. And I was very impressed by the, the beauty of the land in western North Carolina. Um, if you haven't been up there, it's a gorgeous place, and it's fantastic to just get away for a little bit and enjoy life away from the daily grind of work and the internet and you know consequently i returned and i just haven't felt like spending a lot of time on the internet i haven't felt like engaging with the discussions or any of that stuff i just if i find it's all, all just also tiresome and also just soul draining and numbing i feel like uh Every time I open the internet or open one of my messages, I feel like I'm slowly being drained of vital life force that uh, is important to my overall well-being. So I haven't been doing much since coming back. I, I went back to work, but I haven't really read much or engaged with much media as a whole. I did manage to read and mostly finish Honor Levy's novel that seems to be a polarizing yet discussed novel in uh, the New York publishing sphere. For you guys that don't know, Honor Levy is this early 20s female author. She is part of that New York Dimes Square scene. Um, I'm not even going to go into it because you can look it up and see what that dime square thing's about. It's uh, tangential to the Red Scare, Anna and Dasha crowd. But either way, she wrote this book. It's really a collection of her short stories. And uh, some people absolutely hate, hate it. Other people love it. And it's, it's you know, steered up a little bit of a, of a conversation. And that, that's what makes it interesting. That's what really interested me about it is that here we have a book that there's a conversation about. And in this day, that's very rare. You don't have conversations about books at all, at least in the mainstream. And the fact that there's some conversation makes it somewhat interesting. Of course, I was... I had, I had no expectations for it, really, especially after listening to her be interviewed on Red Scare. Uh, she's a kid, at least to me, because I'm 40, and she's like 24 or 23 or something like that. And she comes off as a kid. And after reading her collection of short stories, you know what? And I'm, I'm loath to call them short stories because almost none of the pieces in there have any type of plot. What what it reads like more is blog autofiction. Um, the short stories or the, the, the pieces in this book are just a series of personal emotional observations about uh, situations you have a collection of scenes uh it's more like a a collection of blog scenes and it reads a lot like you know 
20 years ago, my 19 year old girlfriend's live journal post that used to piss me off because I was like, why are they so vague? What are you, what are you talking about here? And, uh, I don't know if that says something about current culture, generation Z or myself as an older man now that, uh, is, you know, entered into what would be considered middle age, but I just, it didn't, it didn't connect. And one of the main reasons it didn't connect at all is because honor levy herself is a I, I hate i hate to say this but she's a comes off as a wealthy trust fund kid i mean looking into her background she is from southern california the daughter of some kind of uh film producer of some sort she ended up uh going to bennington college which is the same college that Brett Easton Ellis and um, what's her name who wrote uh, The Secret History, Donna Tart uh, went to. And this is like a expensive private co- liberal arts college that's focused on writing and art and that type of thing. So it's not like, look, she's not slumming it, right? And she's writing about kind of slumming around through New York and Los Angeles and Europe and stuff. And the question is, how does this feel true? And this tends to be a problem with a lot of what I see as new literature coming out of the New York kind of scene is that it tends to be focused on predominantly rich, you know, young, rich trust fund women going on their little adventures through Europe or their disappointments with their boyfriends or just society in general. And America and the world is not that. All right. We're having a crisis of people reading and the New York establishment gives us honor levies, blog posts of a trust fund kid. And I'm not one of those guys that's like, oh, you know, I'm going to decry the the wealth of people or something like that. You know, it. I, I'm not. I'm, I'm glad. You know, I want my daughter to be well off and I want her to be a trust fund kid. I wish I could make her a trust fund kid. But, you know, and hell, I wish I was a trust fund kid. I wish I grew up wealthy enough to be able to attend Bennington and hang out in the same place as Brett Easton Ellis used to hang out at and get my, my blog post published by the New York... Uh, publishing establishment. So there's no jealousy on my part. I'm I'm happy for her. But what I do have a problem with is that it just doesn't come off as truthful and authentic to the American experience of a 20 year old. And now like I said, I'm 40 and I grew up 20 years ago is when I was on our levy's age. And my experience at that time was not one of worrying about getting into parties or uh, the internet. I could barely afford the internet because I was you know, trying to make ends meet, paying my rent off of a independent coffee shop, coffee espresso slinger paycheck. And do I have enough change in my pocket to afford a pack of Paul Malls and a few dollars for gas so I can get to my shitty coffee shop job, which I, I love to this day. And I also, due to the due to my current job, I spend a lot of time with people in their early 20s, and they're nothing like the people in Honor Levy's book. I could, you know, these are people that are working hard, struggling, trying to, like, pay the rent, trying to figure out how to, like, afford some money for college. Uh, Most of the people I work with that are young and, you know, pretty low-paying positions are struggling and going to school online at night. They're not out, you know, doing speed or, or dropping, you know, mushrooms or anything like that. They're, they're barely making by and they're dating women on Tinder if they can, if they can get it, you know, and it just, it comes off so disconnected from the real world that I grew up in and from the reality of the world around me that I get nothing out of it. There's no emotional connection, but I will say this though. She's a, she's a good writer. And she has a good grasp of language and the 
kind of quirky way she approaches it, like shitlord internet conversations and uh, you know perpetually online stuff, is that you know there, there's definitely potential there. I just wish that she wrote a novel. I wish that she had something to say, and I don't think she has something to say. And maybe that's the problem with Gen Z. Maybe they just have nothing to say. You know, maybe the world has surrounded us so much that there is nothing left to say. And that that scares me in a way because I want to go to Barnes & Noble. I want to hop on my Kindle store and read something from the voice of Gen Z's generation. But honestly, if Honor Levy is the voice of Gen Z, I'm just not interested. Now, otherwise, besides that one, I haven't really read much. I do have a stack of books on my shelf right now that it's, that's pending. Some of them are arcs from people that sent me this because of the podcast. Others are uh, some philosophical texts I picked up. A few uh, religious texts I'm planning on reading soon. And I just bought this book call on UFOs that everybody seems to be talking about. I'll talk more about that in the next few days. But yeah, I haven't really been keeping up on anything. And honestly, like I've kind of slipped into a a phase of playing video games at night instead of reading. And I've been, I finished Cyberpunk 2077, got all the endings, and I started playing on recommendations from you guys. I started playing Disco Elysium, which is a fantastic game. And honestly, between that game and Cyberpunk, I'm starting to change my opinion on video games as art or the value of narration in video games. And uh, we're going to talk about that in probably future podcasts with some guests because you don't want to hear just my opinions on it. And a lot of my uh, friends and friends of the podcast are video game players themselves, and I want to get their opinions because I'm far from being a really good example of a gamer. But what I really want to talk to you about today, and the reason I decided to record this, is because I wanted to talk about the ever-cycling topics of the cybersphere, all right? It's basically every year we have the same discussions over and over and over. We are stuck in a spinning cycle of debate that never seems to have any resolution but every reincarnation of the same debates becomes more and more stupid and less and less nuanced. And this has seemed, this seems to have arrived on the shores of our fair substack and stand. And it even, you know, splits the Shire, the Shire stack down its fault lines. And what I'm talking about is I'm talking about the never ending Tradcath. Uh, religious kind of right versus the vitalist right, the Nietzschean right. That seems to be over and over. And I'm just not really, I feel like the framing of the conversation goes nowhere. And I don't even know how to approach it. And I don't know if um, I should have a guest on here where we can talk about it. I would like to invite Dave Green because he seems to be uh, more um, nuanced in that conversation and then from the opposite side, I wouldn't mind talking to Mr. John Carter because he seems to be on the more vitalist side of the situation. And I'll be honest with you guys, I agree with both sides to a certain degree. But um, right now, I think the best little piece on it is librarians' is, um, reply to Kulak. Now, the one reason I tend to tend to kind of like be weary of the discussion is because I don't find one of the sides fully honest. I feel like the vitalist side tends to be more of a, more of a meme than an actual debatable worldview. And I don't want to debate with, and I don't want to even really engage with like meme magic. But that's not the topic here. The topic of today is actually Gaston. All right. Why Gaston? And who is Gaston? Gaston, the character from Disney's 1991 Beauty and the Beast. Now, 
the Gaston meme tends to be one of those ever cycling uh, topics that comes up. I think I encountered it back in the day on Twitter. I remember actually having this conversation numerous times with people. And the gist of it is that, you know, Gaston is great and he's a alpha male and you should totally be Gaston and the movies do him dirty and, you know, everything else is cuckery and blah, blah, blah. So in a way, it's a meme version of the vitalist versus the traditionalist, you know, conversation. And I don't know why, for some reason, this one triggers me. It's because, well, I'll, I'll tell you right now. The, the reason this one triggers me is because I love Beauty and the Beast. All right. I think, I think that the, out of all the fairy tales, the European fairy tales, Beauty and the Beast is the most important one. And it's the most important one at illustrating and getting down to the heart of the core of European culture and the core of ideal European Christian culture. And I also like the 1991 movie. I think that out of the Disney classics or the Disney um, new golden age, it's the best Disney movie. It's not my favorite. 101 Dalmatians is, and that's mostly because the art. But Beauty and the Beast is my favorite of the great Disney blockbusters. And as a reader and as a father of a girl, I find Belle to be my favorite princess character. And I, a lot of the themes in that story and in that movie resonate with me. But most importantly, I think that the theme itself, the movie itself and the, the fairy tale that it takes its inspiration for have a very important Christian ethic and ethos that it's not just a Christian ethic and ethos. It's a civilizational European ethos. And it's really at the core of the debates between the vitalist right and the Christian right, in my opinion. So I'm going to kind of try to make that case. I'm doing this without any notes or anything. So if I come off as rambling and insane, yeah, I'm rambling and insane. Uh, my necktie has been talking to me a lot and I have no speed or Adderall or anything to, to take to focus my mind. I'm a, I'm fueled on coffee, LaCroix and, uh, my uh, elf bar vape right here. But yeah. So the story of Beauty and the Beast itself is from uh, the middle of the 18th, somewhere in the middle of the 18th century France. It was collected and popularized in the, the great, you know, European fairy tale collections that were very popular around the Brothers Grimm era. But this one was brought forth, I believe, and made popularized in the 19th century. Uh, the Disney movie itself does not break away very much from the original fairy tale. The difference is, is that in the movies, in the movie, in the fairy tale, Gaston doesn't exist, and the merchant father um, has 12 children six boys and six girls and he loves them equally and he's rich and he has a great house and he's a great merchant but disaster strikes a bunch of like a fire burns down his house and he loses all his money except for a ship of his that a chartered ship of his that, that has a bunch of treasure he goes on a journey to recover this merchant ship and when he gets there all the clerks that worked for him basically rob him and he has no money. All he has is like very little left. And before he leaves for this journey, he asks his children, Hey, what do you want me to bring you back? And Belle, his, I believe, youngest daughter tells him, Oh, all I want is a rose because she's very selfless. Right? So when he gets to the ship and all his money's gone and he's ruined he can't really bring any gifts back. And then he remembers that all Belle wanted was a, a rose, which is a very anti-materialistic kind of concept. And he's as he's traveling, he comes across the 
the beast's castle and he plucks a rose which pisses off the beast the beast grabs him and says i'm either going to imprison you or you can bring somebody else in your stead something something and bell volunteers to become the beast prisoner and then we have the beauty and the beast story that's kind of like the main difference right now in the disney version we've all seen it so i'm not going to go over it the rose still plays a, a important key and first of all i wanted to talk about the rose right well okay well let me rewind back right it's i'm of the belief that beauty and the beast is the most important fairy tale because it illustrates the core of the european psyche and the european civilizational project all right and i'm not the only one that believes this and a lot of these ideas that i'm going to put forth are actually from michael walsh's book the fiery angel and the, the book is called the fiery angel art culture sex politics and the struggle for the soul of the west and in the fiery angel he has a chapter called <clears throat> it's chapter eight no i'm sorry it's chapter sev- seven i'm looking through my books right now sorry guys it's called Chapter seven, uh, La Belle and La Bette, which is, you know, the beauty and the beast, right? And he talks about the traditional story and it doesn't really mention the Disney one as much, but uh, it's a great little um, chapter, a little article, a little essay on the idea that beauty and the beast is a fundamental core of European identity. And what I mean by that is that the beast and bell are both opposite sides of what's important because we do not want to be beasts and we do not want to be just loving women and europeans or historically speaking the history of europe and where its great identity comes from is the fact that we are a civilizing force the historically european culture has been a civilizing force, all right? We are not steep warriors, all right? We are not Conan. We are not barbarians that tear down. We are not Genghis Khan and the Mongols that conquered the land but left nothing, right? We are people that built monuments and culture, and sometimes we conquered with words, with novels, with movies, with works of art and beauty, with pure cultural elements that are just as important as the sword and the gun. And attaining that balance, I believe, is key to continuing our civilization, and it's key to attaining the the proper Christian civilizational mindset. And I say that because, you know, that, that's what matters, right? All right. We do not want to revert to barbarism, all right? We do not want to revert to uh, what's shown to the jihad of Paul Atreides' Dune, you know, in Dune, where the uh, Fremen basically destroy and debase the universe through violence because of the strongest. We do not want to embrace the idea of full Nietzschean Superman that has no taming qualities to him no intellectual or romantic taming qualities to him because that's not the world that we want to leave to our children and that's not the world that will allow us to come closer to spiritual fulfillment and that's why i think that the idea of beauty and the beast is is critical right because in all men there's a beast in all of us and in all civilizations there's a beast and the beast can either become decadent and perverted a selfish man child or he can become a violent monster right and the disney movie beauty and the beast does a really good job of showing those two elements of the negative aspect of masculinity which is the beast unchained by morality and fully embraced in pride and who's that character that's gaston gaston's not a free man he's not a self-actuated man he's actually 
worse than the beast because he uses his violence and his strength to not for the good of the community around him, not for art or culture, not for love, but for pride. Gaston himself is in the worst case, a, a man that has given up everything for pleasure and self, um, self, you know, self enjoyment. And he's never going to be a happy man because he always wants more. And he's the prime example of our current modern degenerate culture. Gaston is, yes, he's a, a great example of an alpha male and a successful male, but there's no depth to him. There's no spirit there. He rejects everything about Belle that makes her an interesting figure. He rejects her reading and her th thinking and her, her art. And instead he just chases pleasure. And that's not a man that's free. That's a man that is just like the beast himself. Is That's a man that's trapped by his vices. And that's why I don't like the positive Gaston memes because he's technically a disgusting man. He is technically us right now, a arrogant society that imposes our vices upon the world. And deep beneath of it, we've actually imprisoned our beast, which is the vital masculine nature with a fake masculinity of Gaston, which is really just childishness and infantilism and selfishness, which I'm going to say is not something that we should, you know, put forth as an, even a meme example of our side. But to go back to the kind of spiritual nature of the story, the Disney, the Disney version of it starts with the the prince and he's this rich wealthy guy he's got his castle and he's a selfish you know vain prideful kind of asshole very much like Gaston and the enchantress comes by and she wants to stay the night and she offers him the rose and he like spurns her and then she turns him into the beast basically she takes away all his uh civilizational like trappings and makes him into a a man that has no control over his emotions and his his strength and ties the whole thing with the, the concept of love that he will be freed by this by love and the love we're talking about here is the idea of civilization because i'm a believer that the building block of civilization the building block of all life that's worth living on this planet is love Love between a man and a woman, the creation of a family, and then the taming of the wild beast aspects intellectually, allowing us to create the great monuments of art and culture that live through us, live, you know, into the future, into the, for future generations, and so hopefully till the end of the world. And what the enchantress does to the beast is she cuts him off from that. And you see that symbolically in him being trapped in the ruins of civilization. He's a monster stuck in a decaying castle, a decaying Europe, right? And all the servants are turned into symbols of civilization, uh, the teacups, right? Symbols of um, teacups and chandeliers and, and clocks, right? If you look at those, these are all symbols of civilization, our ability to tell time, um, our et etiquette and our balls, uh, and by balls, I mean, you know, like music balls, right? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, all of it is decayed and chipped and falling apart. And all the servants are trapped with them, which shows that like, you cannot build a society by pure violence, by pure bestiality, at best you'll have is a tribe or people with no options. A true civilization is one where people choose to be part of it and all bring everything together and embrace temperance and embrace 
civilizational aspects. But the Enchantress cuts off the beast and from society and from culture. And it's interesting that the symbol is the rose. And the rose is, you know, first of all, it's a symbol of beauty. But it's a symbol of beauty and violence at the same time, because we all know roses have thorns. Rose bushes are thorny, right? So it's beauty among the ruins, among the among the uh, the violence of thorns. And it's also, the rose is also a medieval symbol of the Virgin Mary. And the Virgin Mary is critical element to understand in Beauty and the Beast. Because the Virgin Mary is critical to the development of Western Europe. Because it's the idea of tempering the violent nature with the feminine ideals of mercy and culture. Right? And if you look at that, Beauty and the Beast itself is an allegorical story of really Europe's success by not being just a violent tribe of men that conquer, but by adopting God and the Christian ideals and tempering their violence with a love of the feminine and really coming close together. And I've always said this, and one of the things I've always been attracted to Christianity in the recent years is that no matter what the feminist anti-Christian kind of left says about Christianity being, uh, anti-feminist and anti-woman it's exactly the opposite out of all the world the major world religions christianity is the only religion that really loves women if you look at histories of you know uh, cultural histories of the medieval and the renaissance medieval europeans loved their girls right they treated their girls well they loved them they didn't lock them up they didn't sell them in the same way uh, Hindu or Muslim cultures did. Medieval Europeans and Christian Europeans really until recently loved their daughters. Okay. We didn't hide our daughters under burqas or hijabs. We didn't look at them as sinful temptresses. We looked at them as, as equals where, Okay, so equals within our own roles and our own scope, but spiritually the same value. And if you look at like uh, fiction and uh, great poems and stuff from the era and the Renaissance later on, look at the Renaissance. We have tons of art of beautiful women and great women, all right, to paint something. To sculpt something means that you re- revere it. Right? You don't see that from any other culture. Okay. The same thing with you know the idea of chivalry and the idea of Queen Guinevere and Lancelot and knights serving women and choosing women that that they basically need to aspire to. And so when you think about it, that's kind of the point of Beauty and the Beast is that a intelligent, dutiful daughter that loves her father chooses to go and sacrifice her life herself for her father and for her people, for her family, for her civilization. And she trades away her freedom, which is, you know, her chilling around in the little French village, reading books all day and singing Disney songs to be trapped in a castle with a monster. And there, when she gets there, she turns her back on her um, logical intellectualism that she shows in earlier scenes of the movie and realizes that the way to approach everything is not through the head, but through the heart. So once again, as you can see, the Virgin Mary, Sacred Heart, that type of thing is clearly put there. And what she does is she rejects the materialistic degenerate Gaston, the petulant man child, the, the product of a degenerate longhouse is what Gaston is. He's basically 
the snooty little brother who gets fawned on by the big sisters. And she rejects that element of European culture, which, by the way, Gaston did not exist in the previous original stories. Gaston is a modern creation. Gaston is a modernist creation thrown onto the story. And it's an appropriate one because it represents the modernist view of the beast. Anyways, and she sees through the violence and monstrosity of the beast and uses her heart, not her head, her spiritual, she uses her spiritual sight to see the truth of beauty in the violence of the beast. And at the end, they become one and rebuild the civilization. So anyways, I think without rambling on and on, I think that that's a very important story. And I think that's what's critical. That's what we're missing here. In all our debates about feminism, femininity, roles, gender roles, um, violence versus nonviolence, we miss the point of balance. We miss the point is that we need Belle as much as we need the beast. Because the product of Belle and the beast is Europe or the idealized Europe. All right. Violence, capability, and masculinity tempered by beauty and love. All right. If you remove that element, on one side you have Gaston, which is prideful self love, a pseudo closet homosexual, immature love of self and self-aggrandizement. And on the other end, you have bestiality, monstrosity. You have, you know, terrorism and violence and rape and murder. And you have the machete-wielding genocides of Africa and Genghis Khan, the loot and raping and pillaging that leaves nothing behind of civilization. But we are in the middle. We temper the masculine urge for violence with love, devotion, and self-sacrifice. And that's how you build civilization. So yeah, that's why I don't like Gaston, guys, okay? That's why I'm on the side of Bell, And that's why I think that Beauty and the Beast is the best Disney movie and also the best fairy tale out of the European canon. All right, let me know what you think about my little thoughts. Um, this was kind of a experimental episode where I rant by myself. On Wednesday, I'm going to record another episode with uh, Mr. Fisto. We're going to talk about all kinds of stuff, so tune in for that one. Until then, enjoy yourself in the Shire Stack. Good night. <laughs>